Welcome to another edition of Catch Up Call, brought to you in association with our official partner, iTalk, sponsors of the iTalk Lounge at the Amex and telephone and broadband suppliers. Today, we cast our mind back to 96, 97 and the tail end of a tumultuous campaign and the last few days of the Goldston ground. Joining us today are two men who played key roles in the final matches of that season. The man who scored the last ever goal at the Goldston ground, Stuart Storer, and the man who seven days later did this. Ruff turns away, falls to Masco, shot goes in, hits the post, it's going to be a follow-up in, just yes! a better start, Robbie right out, has put out the end Now we also welcome a special third guest, a certain Jim Proudfoot, maybe not a name instantly recognisable to Albion fans, but he was the man who was responsible for this iconic piece of Albion commentary. Deliver it the second time, deep towards the back post, up Gutter heads, headed back across the face of the goal, Storer's header, punched off the line by O'Connor, Sturridge comes off the bar, Storer! Stuart Storer has got the goal! The good leap Brighton off the bottom of the table! So, um, just taking things back, starting on that season, um, uh, obviously, Stuart, you were at the club at the start of the season, so we'll start with you. What, what what were your sort of memories going into that season? The club had just been relegated, but I think were fancied to probably bounce back um, on the on the back of that relegation. Yeah, you, you always go into a new season hoping uh, you know things will work out well. Um, so he was quite optimistic. Uh, good set of lads around us, but um, obviously. Didn't get off to a good start and, and things soon started to sort of become clear what was happening at the club, which uh, was devastating for all involved, really. And that it just takes us back to those early games, because I think I think you won the first game of the season. Um, but then I think it was about one win in about 12 games after that that really sort of left you in trouble. Um wasn't long afterwards that Jimmy Case got the sack. What, what, how did that feel? Obviously, football almost became secondary because of, of what was going on off the pitch with the, the club losing the Goldstone ground. Yeah, we had, um, we had several managers over that period and all of them really struggled with the, the politics at the football club. And um, yeah, we, we had a really bad start to the season. The culture was set in and then with the politics added, it just looked like uh, doom and gloom for the rest of the season. And, uh, you know, the further we went into the season, the, the worse it got with the news of um, Mr. Bellotti and Mr. Archer playing their little tricks and, you know, trying to pull the ground from underneath us, as it, as it were. And uh, it, was a, it was a tough position to be in, very tough. And, and obviously Steve Grit came in and... I think you were one of the players that very quickly excelled under under his management. What what was he like when he walked through the door? I guess in, in a way, you know, Jimmy Case had, had been an absolute legend for the club, you know, real stalwart. Sorry to see see him go, I'm sure, but but what was it like when Steve Grit came through the door? Uh, Steve came in with a, a fresh approach. He he was almost very very professional. He had no ties to the club, so there's no emotional ties. And he came in and he was very much, I'm here to do a job. Uh, join in, come with us, come on the journey. Let's see how far it will take us. And him and Jeff Wood were, were like a, a breath of fresh air in some respects because we'd worked with people that would, had been promoted from within the club who knew the club. And, and Robbie, I think I'm right in saying you were his first signing. Um, Fifteen thousand pounds came from Colchester United. What, what, what was it like being in that position where you get the phone call and will you come and join Brighton? We're we're cast adrift at the bottom of the league, seamlessly, seemingly in a hopeless position at that point. How did how did that feel at the time? Uh, it's a hard one, really, because um, I, I wasn't really playing at Colchester at the time. Um, and uh, I know Jeff uh, from my playing days when I used to play with him as when he was goalkeeper at Wivenhoe. Um, and he, he actually contacted me and said, look, I think we've got a good opportunity here. Um, don't, re- don't try and read too much into um, what's going on back 
in the back room staff. Um, we've got a good group of lads here. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to push and, and, and do the best we can with the funds we've got. Um, they, they, they did sell it to me, um, especially because they wanted me to play as well. Um, which, like I said, I wasn't getting at Colchester. And as a footballer, that's all you all you want to do. Is you just want to play football. Um, so I took the opportunity. A lot of people told me I was silly for doing it. Um, did, did any part of 11. you? Did any part of you think you were mad and 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 sort of stop yourself? To think, hang on a minute, am I doing the right thing here? Um, yeah, um, I wanted to play football and. Um, at the end of the day, that's that's what they give me. They give me the opportunity to play football, um, and and it, it turned out to be the best, probably the best decision I could have made, really. And and Jim, you you were commentating on a lot of Albion games that season back in the yeah. the days of, of Capital Gold, working alongside the late Tony Millard. Um, just paint the scene for those viewers and fans that perhaps you know, aren't, aren't old enough to appreciate the, the position that the club were in then? Well, it's just an extraordinary set of circumstances, really, because um, the football, it did feel, by and large, was secondary to what was going on behind the scenes. It was always, you know, further revelations, um, almost sort of hidden subplots to everything that was happening. And there were so many milestones throughout the course of the season. Um, the Fans United game, uh, the boycott, um, the, the match against Mansfield, where um, it, it was very surreal. There were very few people who come into the ground, maybe only 1,000, 1,200, something like that. But you could tell that uh, everybody outside was listening to the game on the radio. And there were thousands and thousands within the vicinity of the Goldstone who were listening. And... and um, I might not get this exactly right, so I apologise to, to Albion fans if, if, if I'm remembering this slightly out of order. But I know a goal went in and there was a massive roar went up outside about five, six seconds after the, the goal had actually been scored. And then somebody had broken a gate down to get in on the old terrace. And we mentioned that. And you heard another roar sort of five seconds later. And then this big wave of people all coming in to watch the rest of the game for nothing. That just felt like sort of that was bog standard. Every game, something was going on. But it was a, it was a soap opera. And I would imagine, it was the guys will tell you much better than me, but you know, any relegation battle must be hard enough as it is when you can purely concentrate on the football. But when you've got so many... Uh, hidden distractions and, and the dynamics completely different from one week to the next with everything that's going on. It must have been just completely bizarre. I still and think it's a, you know, a, a tremendous achievement in being able to, to stay up and, and how Steve had pulled everybody together. For the players to be able to perform at the level they did from the situation that they were in at the beginning of March when we, we were still nine, ten points adrift. To be able to stay up, I think that is one of the, the biggest achievements that I can think of that I've ever had the, you know, the, uh, been fortunate enough to cover. I just think it's a, an, an astonishing feat. Even 23 years later, looking back on it, what, what a job they did. And, and obviously one of the things at that point was that run at the Goldstone, Jim. You would have done a few of those games. Yeah. Just, to, I, I mean, we'll get Stuart and Robbie's take on it in a minute, but what was the atmosphere like at the place? The, the momentum sort of tended to build week, week by week. I can remember beating Wigan, they were champions. The, the four-all draw with Orient. I think the yeah. team went about 12 games unbeaten at the Goldstone. Couldn't, couldn't quite get the form, uh, recreate that form away from home, but did right where it mattered at the end of the season. But just that run at the Goldstone was, was phenomenal, wasn't it? I think it was 12 games. Yeah, and I think it was the it was encapsulated really by the by fans United game against Hartlepool, where, um, and again, forgive me for sort of going back over old ground, but for those that didn't know, it was it was a day that that Brighton fans really rallied all their colleagues up and down the country. We need your support. Please come and join us. Whoever you support, come and wear the shirt of the team that you support, but come and join us and cheer Brighton on for a day. Now, was the score 5-0, Paul? Is that right? 
Yeah, 5-0, 5-0. And, yeah. and, and Craig that, Maskell got felt, a hat-trick. Yeah, um, it just felt like a turning point, didn't it? That, that that was all of a sudden, it was something, it was, a, it was a, a unique day. I've never seen anything like it. And it was also a day that kind of felt that maybe the momentum was beginning to shift, that things were going to be able to turn around and things could go in the right direction. And, and this wasn't an insurmountable battle after all. Now, the, the battle off the field at that stage still felt insurmountable, but it did feel as though there could still be the opportunity that the relegation battle, the relegation side of it might yet be won. And that felt like the day that, to say, them was the catalyst for, for that brilliant run, so many games unbeaten, the majority of which were won, and the, and the gap at the bottom to Hereford and the others slowly was just chipping away. And it just felt every week as though intangibly they were getting closer and closer and closer until, you know, that, that remarkable last three games of the season. It, it almost felt like a promotion run. Stuart, what yeah. was it like playing in that, um, that Fans United game, though? When you, when you think back, to, is it one of those where the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end? But what was it like that day? The, the atmosphere in the, in the, in the ground, as, as Jim said, from a fan's perspective, was unbelievable. But... For a player on the pitch, how 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 was it? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Jim. I think it was a big turning point um, to to hear and have that much support behind you, and then obviously win the game so convincingly and play so well. It it brought a lot of belief to the team and squad. Um, but like you said, there it was it was one week we were up because we were winning at home, and then we was going away from home. And, and couldn't win. So he was up and down like a yo-yo. And we was obviously closing the gap, but it wasn't as quick as we would have liked because of the, the win-lose situation. Um, but it, definitely the Albion fans on that day and all the other fans that came along sort of gave us that little bit more belief that, that it was a possibility. You know, I think a lot of people have written us off. We, we use that as a siege mentality that... Well, everyone's written us off. We haven't got nothing to lose. But, but again, we would have liked to have closed that gap a lot quicker and not let it go down to the, the last couple of games as it did. Did, did, it, did it, it almost felt as a fan that you were turning up expecting to win, even against the likes of Swansea, who you beat 3-2. They were chasing a playoff place. Wigan, who were champions. You know, you, you almost expected to win these games as supporters because of the run that you were on. Was it the same in the dressing room? Uh, for me, yeah, it, it was a completely di different atmosphere at home, obviously, to away from home. And we, we had the confidence at home. It, it was almost like, um, you know, the old adage of the 12th man. And with that uh, support behind you, uh, it just gave you another 2 or 3% uh, effort, commitment, whatever you want to call it. Uh, when you was going away from home, we, did, we didn't really have such a backing and, and, and it made a massive difference at home, yes. And, and Robbie, obviously, you came in a month after that Fans United game. Um, I, I think you made your, debut, your home debut against Northampton and, and scored in a, in a really important 2-1 win. What, what was that like coming into the team or, or on that run and playing with such confidence and, and in such a good run of form at the Goldstone? Yeah, it, 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 it didn't really feel any different to when I was playing at Colchester. Um, they would, when you're in that changing room, you get into like this bubble. And, um, obviously, it was, like you said, it was a lot better. The bubble was a lot easier when you're at home and from when it was from away. But it, it, was, it didn't feel really any different to what, I'd really been used to. Maybe I was just too young and naive at the time. I didn't really understand it. I didn't really know what was going on or tried not to understand what was going on behind the scenes. I was just concentrating on my football. And um, and I think that's credit to um, the, the senior players, um, the coaching staff, who tried to keep it as normal as possible, if you, if you, if you know what I mean. It was... I was there to do a job to play football and, and they kept me on that path. And, and one of the games, as you got to that final three, four games of the season, I think one of the games that often gets overlooked uh, was away at Cambridge. 
where where you I think you'd won the previous week, possibly uh, would have been the Wigan game at home. You went to Cambridge, picked up a draw. You scored in that, and actually that that point suddenly put your destiny in your own hands. You you knew at that point if you won the last two. Um, you'd be safe. How, how did that feel after that Cambridge game and scoring that goal? Uh, really, well, any goal's good uh, when you score, um, especially even more so when you're in the, in the position we were. Um, and again, it wasn't it wasn't until after the game that um, I think it was Craig Maskell actually said to me, "Did you know that's the first goal that we've scored away from home in X amount of games?" It was it was absolutely crazy. Um, what would that week have been like in the lead up to that that game, that final game at the Goldstone, um, knowing that your destiny was in your own hands? Well, it's it's something only the the, the coaches can instil the confidence in you. You know, we've 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 drawn away to um, Cambridge. Um, they, they, basically, they were just saying, you know, we've we've. We've had such an amazing run at home. Let's keep it going and and go into that final game, giving us the, the best opportunity that we can. You know, we couldn't. I don't think, as a team, we could have done any more to, than what we were actually doing. Paul, and, I, can, and, I can remember Paul going to the training ground on the Thursday before the game. Um, it was a very different world back then. We we go and. and um, turn up and, and interview basically whoever we wanted to interview and I remember speaking funnily enough to Stuart and, and also to Jeff Minton I wanted to speak to Steve Grip and um, Jeff didn't realise that, uh, that the manager was waiting and he just sat and waited and picked the mud off the bottom of his boots he was calmness personified and I remember thinking if the players can get a handle on this if this, if this is how the build up has been, been all week he nothing would have faced Steve that day, um, you know, forty-eight hours before the Saturday, and I don't know whether that was indicative of of how training had gone. But I just I remember driving away from the training ground, thinking they're going to pull this off, they're going to be okay, because there was just so so calm. You'd have thought that they were going for you know maybe the opportunity to finish ninth or tenth. No pressure, nothing whatsoever. Not the whole future of the club depending on what happened on Saturday. Uh, which it could have done because, you know, lest we forget, if the other result had gone the other way, if, if Albion had lost at home to Doncaster and Hereford had picked up something at Orient, that was it. It was the last game at the Goldstone and it was, uh, you know, a funeral procession on the way out because Brighton had lost their league status. Never have picked that up from from how Steve was. So to hear Robbie say there that, uh, you know, the players felt so confident going into that last home game of the season. I can believe it. And and it just seemed that Steve and Jeff had done such a fantastic job in, uh, you know, taking all the pressure, as much pressure as they could off them. Well, it, it, was, it, it was remarkable considering what was at stake. And, and Stuart, obviously you, you scored that goal, I think, midway through the second half. Um, you've probably told this, this story more than any other story in your life, but... Um, just remind us of um, you know it again and, and and what it meant to you and and how it unfolded. Um, I think it was certainly one of the loudest cheers I ever heard at the Goldstone. Mm. That's for sure. Yeah, well, it, as Robbie's, it's very very difficult to describe. You know, the the feeling within the camp, the the run we was on. Um, you you sort of in a bubble, like Robbie says, you, you're in a bubble. Um, but the bubble's very hard to describe because you've got an outside world going on, but you're concentrating on your job and that's all that you're focused on. And obviously, as we was creeping nearer and nearer to safety, we were relying on results. Uh, and obviously, going into that last game, we knew all we could do was win the game. And if we could do that uh, and keep our fingers crossed that uh, Hereford slipped up, that... You know, we had one last throw of the dice going away to Hereford. But the game was obviously the last game at the Goldstone. There was a, a loads of fans there. And the atmosphere, a good hour and a half before the match, was buzzing. It was, it was uh, amazing. Um, the balloons everywhere, banners everywhere. Um, even driving into the ground, just blue and white, a sea of blue and white. And this is like an hour and a half before the match. 
Um, remember the warm up? I, I was buzzing in the warm up. Even you know, usually a warm up, you go out, you do your stretches, you you get your mind focused. But you know, you went back into the dressing room and you could just look around the dressing room and nobody said anything. Nobody said a thing, and you just knew that was going to give it a right good go. And um, you said about Bairdy being sent off. I think it affected us massively uh, because they took me up front from the wing and at half time, they put me back on the wing and put Robbie up front. And, and I was more comfortable there. And um, yeah, the, the goal itself... Um, Great bit of commentary, Jim. Love it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I was just glad I got you. Know, glad I got the scorer's name right. That's the most important thing. Yeah, great bit of commentary. But yeah, it was just a corner, decent corner in, a bit of a melee, and then um, yeah, I, I keep thinking I was about eight yards out, but you know, I would think about two yards out, so I couldn't really miss it really. But yeah, what a, what a release of energy as well. Um, you know, I did my Klinsman dive, um, and I think I was knackered for the next 10 minutes, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a, a great release of emotion, and then it was trying to get your head back on the game, and in that professional manner, that we had a job to do. I think a bit later on, um, I think there was another roar from um, the score at Hereford, and, and I remember that giving me that extra bit of boost again, you know, that living hell, we, we might be able to do this. And um, well, thankfully, we held on. And um, obviously, that was the, the last game at the Goldston. And then obviously, a week later, you went to Hereford knowing a draw was enough. Um, Robbie, we'll, we'll bring you back in on this one because you, you, you're very close with him even, even today, but you were great pals back in the team then. But your good friend Kerry Mayo put through his own net early on. Um, what were your memories at that point? It must have been, you all must have felt for him for sure. Yeah, um, I think I think you do. Um, anytime anybody scores an own goal, but especially with somebody that's a, a homegrown lad um, playing for his home team, it's um, even worse. Well, I can only imagine it being even worse. Um, but it, it, yes, it, it, it was a, a downside of the day. But once again, I don't think that it, it didn't ch change anything other than we've now got a score. That was it, which we'd always planned to do anyway. I don't think that had ever changed. Um, I think going personally, I think going into the game looking for a draw was probably the worst scenario we could have had. So actually then going one nil up probably turned it in our favour because we had to fight. We were, you know... With a, with a draw, you can go defensive, which can sometimes backfire on you. And maybe it backfired us on at the start. But um, I think it perked us up. Um, you know, we, it wasn't just my goal. We had plenty of other opportunities. Anybody could have scored that day. It was just fortunate for me that it was me that scored it that day. You, you were the man, though. So don't be, don't be too modest. But um, what was going through your... your, your head as you were being told get stripped you're going on did, did you feel this is my chance this is my, this could be my moment here um no I'd, I'd, but would, would, honest, you, I would you go really into any, any game me. would you go into any game believing that you were going to score even coming off the bench uh yeah as a striker you always do um yeah. if you if as a striker if you if you don't think you're going to score there's no point you being a striker um and yeah, he, like I said, he, he didn't. I didn't really hear much of what he said. I just wanted to get on. Um, and again, I was just in a fortunate place. It could have been Craig Maskell's volley that hit the post and ended up going in, and you know we would have been thinking about him. But it was just, and and the only the only fit time I did think about it was when it actually fell on my left foot, because my left foot is not the greatest. Um, and it was just a hit and hope, really. I, there was no placement or anything. It was just a guts or glory shot, and fortunately, went through the goalkeeper's legs. So, you, you, to be fair, you're doing yourself a disservice because the one thing you did was react to the the shot that came back off the post quicker than anyone on that pitch. Yeah, but like I said, the only two I was really chasing against was Baird and Maskell, and I had about ten <laughs> years on them. So, 
Um, yeah, it's, it, no, don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm extremely privileged to have, have my name in um, the folklore at Brighton Football Club. But it's, um, you know, it's what I, it's what I did. I, I, I wanted to score goals, and if it, if I hadn't have been there quick enough, then I wasn't doing my job. So, um, but it was a, again, it was a joint effort. We've all we've all kicked in to to get to that position. You know, they were doing that before I turned up. So. Um, yeah, I am fortunate that it was, it was my left foot that got on the end of it. Those two goals, obviously, absolutely priceless in the, in the eyes of the Albion fans. What, what were the celebrations like afterwards, Robbie? I mean, they, they, there's some great footage of you guys disembarking the bus back at the Goldston and, and being embraced by fans. But I'm sure that those celebrations went on for a, a few days, if, if not weeks even. <sighs> Well, I don't know about Stuart, but mine lasted for about uh, 48 hours. I know we all went, I think we all went out in, into town that night. Um, and I've never seen so many, I know we have a lot of support with Dan and Brian, but I didn't realise how many we did have, because they all seemed to be out in Brighton Town Centre that night. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, um, it was good. You had the senior players, again, telling you, you know, it, yes, it is a, an achievement what we've done, but, you know, Next year is going to be a, a whole new. So they, they they kind of had a leveling experience, but being a youngster at the time, I just wanted to have a little bit of fun. So. And 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 Stuart, your memories as well. I I always remember reading, you, you, particularly after the Goldson game, I think it was, and scoring that goal. Your your neighbours greeted you with a, 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 I think it was flowers and balloons all on your doorstep to say thanks for scoring that goal. Yeah, it was a real nice touch from the neighbours as well. And uh, yeah, the celebrations, obviously, uh, the psychology behind the, the, the Hereford match, like, like Robbie says, rightly so, them scoring was probably the best thing, or let's say Kerry scoring was probably <laughs> the best thing that could have happened. Um, you know, and, and then obviously us getting ourselves back into the game uh, had a massive effect on their confidence as well. And thinking like you said before, that we went all season. I, I can't remember. Did we get four or five points away from home all season? Um, it, you know, getting the draw was brilliant. And that final whistle seemed an age. You mm. know, everybody was looking at their clocks and their watches and thinking, when's this whistle going to go? And when it went, we just all piled onto the pitch. And, uh, yeah, I, I think 48 hours was right with Robbie. Uh, I think I went missing for 48 hours and, and, and the wife was sending out search parties for me. <laughs> I, I think you'd earned that, to be fair, with the, uh, <laughs> with the two results. But, but also, looking back on some of the characters in, in, in that squad, who are the, who are the ones that, that really stand out in terms of your teammates as well, Stuart? The, you know, we, it was quite strange because... We, we had a bad year the year before. We had a bad start to the season. And it, it's quite easy to try and dig people out. But we all stuck together. And I think because we were a good set of lads at the start, that helped towards the end as well. You know, and, and they all had different characters. Jeff Minton was very quiet and just got on with his game. Mark Morris was loud and Larry. You know, Bairdy was, you know always having a little dig at you and, and things like that. The young lads had lots of enthusiasm and we all brought something to the party. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it was that togetherness that was, yeah. we'd lost a little bit in, in the start of the season. Steve Grit and Jeff Wood brought it together. And, and that's the main reason why we got out of trouble because we, we all had a part to play. We all dug in at times. You know, we, we, we all didn't play well at times as well. Uh, but, but again, as a group of people, fortunately, you know, we managed just in time uh, to, to get out of trouble, which uh, again, like Ro Robbie said, it's, it's lovely to go down in folklore that we were part of something uh, that was such dead and buried. You know, like Jim said, we, everybody thought we were dead and buried and out of it. And um, we did it. Brilliant, weren't it? And and one of the things I always remember someone telling me that had been to the Chelsea game that day um, and they were on a train, packed train carriage and 
when the result came through from Hereford, the whole carriage cheered with all these fans from different games around London. There, there did did seem to be a real desire for, for, for Brighton. I think because of the history, the 83 Cup final, it hadn't been so long that the club had been eating at the top table of football, but there did seem to be a real momentum behind the club from, from the rest of football with everything else going on at the club. Yeah, I think it was the, the underdog mentality as well. I just think it was it was so unbelievable that we got that close that um, we brought everybody else on side and they wanted us to achieve it as well. And and Jim, just from, from your point of view as a broadcaster, someone that's covered football for um, a number of years now, how important and integral was that result and uh, 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 you know the two results the, the the victory over Doncaster the draw with Hereford staying in the league how how integral was that to the club's very being you know staying in business um you know for for, for someone in the media reporting on that at the time it, it can't be underestimated surely no no not at all and uh, we'll, we will never know and it's easy to sort of sit here a generation on and make glib comments about it but without those two goals I don't think we would be talking about Brighton as a as a you know a Premier League side now I can't conceive that that could possibly be the case that, that where the club is now all distills back down to that remarkable last month six weeks of that of that 96-97 season because I think it would have been very, very difficult to, to keep it going as an entity. Playing football in Gillingham in non-league from from where uh, the club had been, I, I think that it would have been very, very easy for... And I'm not decrying the efforts of the loyal supporters that, you know, still made the journeys up and, and, and you know, kept the club going and everybody behind the scenes uh, and, and, you know, what subsequently was done when they got Archer out of the place. But I just think that... Um, it would have been so much more difficult had league status not been maintained from a you know, financial aspect as, as opposed to anything else. So I think you can look back and, and say that, you know, the magnificent stadium that there is now, the, the, the brilliant support, every, you know, all the fantastic work that is done by the club for the community. Uh, so much of it comes down to, and, and, you know, clearly Stu and Rob are very modest about the parts that they've played and, and you can't forget you know, all the other people there behind the scenes, uh, you know, from, from the playing staff and, you know, the other players. But but you can't play down what that team has done for the history of Brighton and Hove Albion Football Club. And and, and certainly, Robbie and, and Stuart, starting with you, Robbie, it, it's fair to say the club won't ever forget what you've done. Certainly the fans won't. Um, been to the Amex and, and most recently to the... Uh, Cup semi-final I think Stuart you were there for that uh, you know what what's that like you must bump into Brighton fans all the time um, how is that Robbie as you go about your day-to-day -day life I bet you, you still get recognised quite regularly and, and get a pat on the back don't you? Uh, well funny enough um, I was not long working um, at the job I'm at now for Network Rail and uh, I was doing a night shift as I am now and uh, I was speaking to the signalman um, and one of the processes is that um, you have to give your your name to get a line blockage. So I've, I've reeled off my name and he said, oh, could you spell that surname for me? And I spelt it and he turned around and he went, not the Bobby Rhino, are you from Brighton and Hove Albion? <laughs> um, so it's quite like after so many years, I think it had been like 12, 13 years, that the, 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 they still picked up and he was a, obviously a Brighton supporter. Um, so yeah, you, you, uh, I, sometimes not as much nowadays because I'm obviously getting older, greyer. Um, but I still certain certainly do get a couple of like strange looks when I walk around. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Stuart, obviously you were at the cup semi final recently um, as a guest of the club, rightly so. I think a lot of the past players were invited. Um, you know, fantastic to still have that connection and that 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 um, bond with the Albion supporters, no doubt. Yeah, I just find it really uh, humbling and um, it, it's lovely. It is really lovely. I've been down to the Amex a few times and uh, it's really nice to see old faces, you know, and, and talk about 
the old times, but it's really good seeing what's been built. Like you said, the Amex is fantastic and the way uh, the club has gone forward uh, is is brilliant. And and like like Robbie, I've I've been I've been in Berlin, I've been in America, uh, I've been Cheltenham just before we, we had the, the coronavirus. Um, people uh, from Brighton are coming up and talking to me and it, it, I find it really uh, lovely that you know uh, that they hold me with such esteem um, and you know like, like like we said in folklore it, yes we will be remembered but there was a lot more people involved than, than me and Robbie and we've got to remember them as well well, it has been brilliant catching up with you all. Um, fantastic memories, great times. Um, the club obviously went through much tougher times thereafter, but now in a in a great period. I thank you for, for giving up your time and joining us. Um, stay safe, stay well, and uh, join us on the next catch-up call for the Albion fans watching. Um, thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.